Yes, her hands may be hardened from labor, and her dress may not be very fine. But a heart in her bosom is beating that is true to her class and her kind. And the grafters in terror are trembling when her spite and defiance she'll hurl. For the only and thoroughbred lady is the rebel girl. Welcome to another episode of the Irish People Podcast. This is the first of two episodes for International Women's Day. In this episode, we focus on a woman who doesn't always get the coverage that she deserves, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, the rebel girl. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was a member of the IWW. She was a labour leader, an activist, a communist and founder of the American Civil Liberties Union. She was instrumental in the campaigns to save Joe Hill and Sacco and Vanzetti. And she was a fierce opponent of fascism throughout her life. We are delighted to be joined by Professor Mary Ann Trichatti, who teaches rhetoric and is Director of Labour Studies at Hofstra University in New York. She is currently completing a book on the civil liberties activism of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. You're very welcome. Could we start with a short introduction about Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, um, her background, where she grew up and her family? So she is uh, a homegrown American radical, which is really terrific. And uh, because, you know, we have the sense in the U.S. that radicalism is this foreign import. And so those of us who know otherwise really embrace our our homegrown radicals. She uh, was born in New Hampshire. But when she was young, her family moved to the Bronx in New York. And so she lived uh, most of her life uh, in New York although she did travel around the country and really loved the West. Her mom, Annie Gurley, was Irish born and a feminist and a socialist, as was her father. And so she grew up kind of inhaling, uh, you know, socialism. Um, it, It nourished her intellectually, I guess, the way food would nourish you physically. And she went to meetings with her father um, and she was herself really smart and although I think she had a really great sense of humor, the impression that I get also from, you know, things that other people have said is that she was also a very serious, very, very political person from a young age. She's a silver medal debater um, in school. So she was, uh, you know, very talented and eloquent as a speaker, even uh, while she was a high school student. Um, and she uh, became an activist at a really young age. Um, I think it was, I can't imagine her being anything else, right? She would go to meetings with her dad and she internalized all this stuff. And it, I think it really became important for her. And the other thing, so the, the exposure to socialism as a way of thinking and a mode of activism happened at a very young age, but she also witnessed poverty. Um, among the people around her. So the material conditions of life under capitalism were very clear to her uh, at a young age that, that, you know, an enormous number of people struggled to make ends meet while a much smaller number of people did exceedingly well. So I think both that the material conditions of of her family and the the families and, and people around her combined with the exposure to socialism as a philosophy and a mode of activism really molded her from a young age into um, an enemy of capitalism and an advocate for working people. James Conley uh, spent time in her house, I believe, and um, Conley had an influence on her in regards to understanding that the struggle against colonialism and imperialism was tied up to working class liberation everywhere. They were guests at the Flynn home and it sounds like it was a lot of fun when they were around. I'm sure it was very convivial, lots of arguing and and laughing and but also very serious, you know, politics. And yeah, from Connolly, I think she she learned at a very young age and, and this informed her perspective from the rest of her life. One, she became an internationalist and remained an internationalist till till the end of her life. Uh, so although she was, as I said, a homegrown American radical, very focused in the early parts of her career, especially on the U.S. labor movement. She never um, she never thought of uh, the U.S. labor movement or radical 
you know, activism in general as kind of bound within uh, a particular nation, right? That what happened, the struggle in the US was linked to the struggle in, you know, North and South America generally and Europe and all over the world, India, you know, uh, uh, Africa, everywhere. And that I think Connolly really influenced her. Um, this idea that you could not be uh, a socialist or, or uh, an enemy of capitalism. You could not really argue uh, the flaws of capitalism if you didn't see capitalism as a global system and you didn't see colonialism as implicitly bound up with the capitalist project um, and you were not uh, an active ally of uh, people struggling against colonial oppression around the world. Um, and, and, and what she also got from Connolly, I think, too, is that you could be very much a, um, a citizen of your nation and an advocate for the people within your nation, uh, because you know Connolly was right, an advocate for a free and independent Ireland. But it it didn't stop at independence from British rule, right? It was a workers' republic, and that very much informed Flynn's thinking too. That you know she was, as she said, you know, an American, and and most of her career was played out here, and she was very uh, defense. Uh, her defense of civil liberties, which we can talk about uh, in a few minutes, was very tied into the First Amendment. Um, and she recognized that the U.S. Constitution grants uh, First Amendment rights to people here in the U.S., but she also recognized that she was struggling for the rights of workers around the world, um, not just in the U.S., and that what happened in the U.S. affected places elsewhere and vice versa. Um, and I think that, that was, that's key to understanding her politics, how she could be both very American but an internationalist and an anti-colonial activist at the same time. Her political career began very early. Um, she was an activist when she was about 16, I think, which was quite unusual for the time. She really was, you know, precocious, or maybe we would even say, what's the word for somebody who is young and um, a prodigy? She was a political prodigy, right, in that way, kind of like a political Mozart at a very young age. She was articulating these uh, arguments against capitalism and in favor of socialism and women, uh, how women's lives would be improved under socialism. And uh, yeah, that I mean, she was... Uh, she earned the nickname the rebel girl from Joe Hill, um, but she also was called the East Side Joan of Arc um, by Theodore Dreiser, the, the novelist. And, and actually more people at the time uh, thought of her as the East Side Joan of Arc than the rebel girl. That name was much more contemporary for her. So like Joan of Arc, she was an advocate for the oppressed, you know, went against the, the major power of the time, it, the seemingly insurmountable, uh, insurmountable odds, very charismatic, um, a woman, in leading men very often, the sole woman uh, leading an, an army, so to speak, uh, uh, of men. Um, so there are lots of parallels. You could see why she would have been called the East Side Joan of Arc, even though she wasn't uh, from the East Side. She was from the Bronx, so it was a little bit off. But uh, yeah, she was, and she left high school. She never finished high school. Um, despite having all this potential as, as a student. Um, she was also offered a career in the theater. Uh, and turned that down and said, I speak my own piece. I'm in the labor movement and I speak my own piece. She didn't want her her uh, performances, so to speak, to be scripted. Uh, she really wanted to uh, call her own shots. And she was tremendously popular. Uh, when she her first uh, speech on a soapbox um, in Times Square, she was arrested for stopping traffic. And you could imagine why she would have. Right here was this beautiful young wisp of a girl um, just just spouting uh, the, the principles of socialism and why women would do better in a socialist state than under capitalism. And it, it, some, of, some of what I'm sure brought crowds to hear her speak was just this idea of this young girl who was such a ferocious speaker and a ferocious arguer and yet was this like slender, um, you know, white skinned, I don't know, some people thought she had raven hair, some people thought it was slightly red, you know, you get these kind of different um, different descriptions of her, but always this like really fiery speaker who was um, young and beautiful. And wow, you know, how do we reconcile those two? Uh, which is really interesting. I actually found a letter that uh, someone who had heard her speak uh, when she was a little bit older, heard her speak for Sacco and Benzetti. So she was, um, you know, in her, uh, much beyond her teens, um, but, but still not even middle-aged and still recalled the way when she held up her hand to talk about the way workers should, should unite in solidarity, you know, not, not with the fingers open, 
but with the fingers together like this. Um, and he still remembered how beautiful her skin was and how beautiful her hand was and how he was mesmerized by the things she was saying. So I think it was a combination of youth, intellect, eloquence, beauty, and that just made her this striking figure. Um, and the newspaper articles all over the place about the girl orator and the girl socialist and, and this incredible package that people found irresistible, frankly, um, and really, really incredible and amazing. And I would give almost anything to have been, you know, on a street corner anywhere, actually, when she was speaking. It was a time of major violence when the labour movement and strikes were brutally oppressed and members of the Wobblies were lynched. Um, could you maybe give a bit of context about the time? It really was. I mean, that early 20th century was a pretty pretty wild, uh, pretty wild ride for, uh, for, you know, workers in general who were trying to organize themselves. Um, and the Wobblies were just so audacious. Uh, there was, there was, they just pushed back, talk about speaking truth to power. I mean, they just pushed back um, against power wherever they found it. And one of the things that they attempted to do, and it, it it's interesting to me is to, to think about this because we take for granted, right, the kind of the, the you know, we live in, in a, almost like a, a uh, you know, late stage capitalism now. So we, we kind of take the system for granted, whether we like it or not. But early 20th century wobblies, they, they, they still had as their goal to eradicate the system, to get rid of the wage system. Um, and she, the wobblies were syndicalists, right? So they didn't, they had no truck with electoral politics. They weren't going to form a party. They didn't encourage people to vote. You fought the fight at the point of production on the shop floor, wherever it was, right? Where if they were selling, um, you know, if, if, uh, if the, the sharks, as they were called, if the, the, the jobs, uh, the people who were selling jobs in the lumber industry, for example, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, they were selling jobs. Sometimes jobs didn't, they, they didn't exist. So you would pay for, you know, the right to work somewhere. And then you'd go out into the, you know, out into the, the forest to supposedly a job site only to find out that there was no job or, and you had already paid and you had no recourse. And so what the Wobblies did to fight back against that was they would just start speaking in front of the place where um, the jobs brokers were operating or, you know, in front of as in, you know, Lawrence or Patterson, they, they invented the moving strike, the mobile picket line, and they would just walk around the factory singing, chanting, booing, cheering. Um, and everything was done at the place where the exploitation was happening. And so they really were, um, quite extraordinary in that. Um, and, and, uh, she, this was, this was really appealing to someone like Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. You know, she always wanted to be where the struggle was happening. So she started her career out as a syndicalist, um, as a as a jawsmith for the IWW. And she took part in some of the most iconic struggles of that union. Um, you know, the free speech fights, Missoula, Spokane, uh, then in Patterson, New Jersey, actually a little bit later. Um, and in the, you know, the 1912 Bread and Roses strike in Lawrence, 1913 Patterson Silk strike, strike in the Masabi range. Um, she was there. She was always on the front lines. And she herself never faced um, physical harm. You know, she was never beaten. Uh, she she was such a celebrity, actually, that she would call attention to the struggle whenever she showed up. All the locals would say, oh, my gosh, here comes the brains of the organization. And we better watch out because, uh, you know, she's going to have the press here and everybody's going to be following her. And that's, in fact, what happened. I mean, she used her gender. And, you know, this kind of notion of chivalry, right, uh, to her advantage. Um, and so she herself never suffered, like I said, any kind of physical um, harm. Um, she used her notoriety, her, her fame, uh, to her advantage also to call attention to these struggles um, and to really uh, shed light on the brutality that was visited against people um, who were, uh, you know, guys, uh, immigrants, hobos, um, and the like who were um, uh, fighting back. And, and I think the important thing to note, too, about these early 20th century struggles and the, the violence that was visited upon uh, Wobblies, for example, uh, you mentioned lynching, like Frank Little, um, who was lynched, um, and uh, others who were brutally beaten, <clears throat> thrown in jail, is that these were local struggles, too. That, that as of yet, the federal government was not um, cracking down. So, you know, these were struggles that were happening sometimes simultaneously, um, but always in, in, you know, various locales. And that's uh, partly why the Wobblies were really good at fighting back too, is because they were a very mobile organization um, because they were open to um, 
anybody who was a worker uh, could join the union. And many of the workers that that uh, did join or that did, uh, you know, feel loyal to the union were um, itinerant workers. So they would just show up in these places. The Wobblies would issue a call and uh, they would show up and push back against ordinances that restricted uh, street speaking with a pro-labor message or, um, you know, efforts uh, to organize. Um, and so their mobility actually made them a force to be reckoned with during this period where the repression was serious, but it was also hyper-local, um, right? So, and there really was no kind of uh, coordinated federal campaign um, until World War I. Um, but she was she was absolutely in the front lines um, all the time, though, as I said, protected by her fame, her beauty, her gender um, and the guys in the union who would, you know, who were quite, quite protective of her. Um, in fact, some of the early free speech fights in Missoula and Spokane, the calls for the Wobblies to come in and get on the soapbox and break the law and they would get thrown in jail. They'd get hosed, you know, they'd get <laughs> beaten. <coughs> A lot of the their reasons for coming was to protect Girlie Flynn. Right, that you know this this kind of call to you know they, they, to protect the the rebel or the, the East Side Joan of Arc, right, from these goons who wanted to beat up on her and the people who were um, who uh, she was leading. So it was a pretty wild time. Could we talk briefly about Joe Hill, her relationship with him, and the campaign for his release? Um, it always struck me that his letters to her while he was in prison awaiting his exit that Hill had a huge amount of respect, but also a fondness for her, um, even more so than other members of the IWW who he wrote to at the time. Uh, It's interesting because he he only met her after he had been imprisoned and she came to visit him. And I think Hill fell a little in love with her, or perhaps I'm over-romanticising. I don't think you can over-romanticise the Elizabeth Gurley Flynn of the wobbly days like you you it's the stuff of which you know legends are made and the 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 great thing about it is it's all true there's one story that unfortunately is not true that i was i i was a little bummed out to find out that it wasn't true but it's probably the only one that i've in this free speech fight was going on in spokane she chained herself to a lamppost so that if they wanted to arrest her, and she was pregnant, by the way, when she went to, to uh, she had she got married, she met a minor in Missoula, Montana, Jack Jones, got pregnant, had a miscarriage, then she got pregnant again. When she was leading the free speech fight in Spokane, she was pregnant. And this kind of troubled her wobbly, you know, the guys uh, that she was working with uh, in the IWW. And at one point they said, oh, it ain't, it ain't natural. Girlie will have the baby up there on the platform. So they wanted her to kind of tone it down and, and keep safe. And, and there was some, I think, reasonable thinking about that, right? She's pregnant. They're hosing people. You know, they're beating people. They're jailing people. You don't want this pregnant woman to be physically harmed, right? But also... You know, it was, it was 1909, 1910. So we're still in this period where there are things like pregnancy aren't spoken about publicly. And here she is in public. So labor had a problem with labor, right? Like the labor that women do to have children was was like, oh my gosh, we don't want that in the labor movement right now, or at least not publicly. But, but that's so, I mean, that's incredible. This 19 year old pregnant woman out there advocating, she did not chain herself to a lamppost. That's an urban legend, right? But wow, what an urban legend. She, I wouldn't have be surprised if, if she had. I actually went to Spokane and, and found out that that was a myth. And I, cause I was gonna go to the street corner and like, you know, I wasn't gonna chain myself to the lamppost, but just feel that feeling. Um, but there was something about her audacity and her commitment to the struggles of working people that that lasted her whole life and that really spoke to people in the movement. I mean, this is a woman who's whatever her politics and, and you know, when she's and we'll talk about this, but but when she is in the party and, you know, the, the Soviet Union's doing some things that are hard to defend and we can question the wisdom or the, you know, whether how much denial she's in. Um, but in her early days, there's none of that yet, right? And and she is, it is a, a commitment to the struggles of, and even in, as a communist, she retains that connection to, and that fundamental commitment to the struggles of working class people. And I think that that always shines through. And, and people like Joe Hill, you know, that resonated with them. Um, her commitments were sincere, her moxie, you know, her, her, her audacity was admirable. Um, 
she really was quite a romantic figure. There's a novel uh, by Jess Walters that came out that you should read if you haven't read it, The Cold Millions. And I actually wrote to him after I read the book and, and said, I, I, I think he really captured, I mean, some of the things uh, he said, he had Elizabeth Gurley Flynn say, I'm not quite sure she would have said that way, but, but he captures her spirit. And the, the way in which people were, I mean, one of the, the main characters in the novel is just enthralled by her. And for the rest of his life, right? He, he is, he, when we when we see him again at the end of the novel as an older person, he thinks back to Girly Flynn and he's still, you know, his heart skips a beat. That That's real. I mean, that, that charisma is something you really can't fake. You can't, in some ways you can't even define what it is. And she had that. And I think that Joe Hill fell under her spell. Um, and, and then when you meet her and you find out that this woman that you, you, you are just so taken, taken up in and taken by, taken by, uh, is as committed to the struggle as she appears to be, that's gotta be, you know, a, a really, almost like a drug, you know, a really powerful, a powerful substance to, to imbibe, right? So you meet this woman and, and you, everything I've read suggests that she was extraordinarily compassionate in person. She really cared about how people felt about, uh, you know, whether people were uh, in prison, uh, people who were in prison, whether they were fed properly, whether they were warm, whether their families were taken care of. So she had that kind of public persona that was really magnetic and charismatic, but she also had a warm and compassionate heart um, that I think really drew people to her. And uh, Joe Hill is, I think, one one example, Um, you know, she was a romantic figure um, by all accounts. And, and uh, that's a really great example. And she cared. I mean, she actively worked to secure his release um, and failed um, and felt terrible about that. Uh, she felt terrible about the lynching of Frank Little. I mean, these things really affected her Sacco and Vanzetti. She felt these things very deeply uh, because uh, unlike a lot of other activists in you know, radical socialist politics, she did not She did not care about the working class as an abstraction. She cared about working people, right? Individuals and the the class to which they belong, but she never lost sight of the importance of individuals and, you know, how they felt in their daily lives. It was a period of revolutionary politics. We had the introduction of the Espionage Act. Um, You know, she opposed World War I. She was involved in the campaign to save Sacco and Vanzetti. um, And she was subsequently targeted for these things. So she actually, um, she was, so the IWW was opposed to the war, but rather than directly confront it the way the Socialist Party did in the US, they, uh, they just continued to organize in the war industries. So that was sort of their way of poking at the war machine. Um, and so she did that right in the iron range of Masaba. Um, and, uh, she never shied away from organizing workers, even in those industries that were considered essential to the preparedness campaign and then to the war. Um, and, and, and socialists in the U S radical socialists, not just the socialist party. Um, unlike many, uh, uh, unlike what happened in Europe, they, they kind of, they remained, uh, opposed to the war. The interesting thing about Flynn though, is though she was rounded up with other wobblies um, under the Espionage Act, right? And she was targeted specifically for a pamphlet that she had published on sabotage. Um, It was called Sabotage the Conscious Withdrawal of the Workers Efficiency. And she had actually published that a few years earlier um, for the, um, the, around the time of the Patterson Silk Strike, 1913, that failed strike that happened after the famous successful Bread and Roses Strike in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Um, And she herself had, you know, and sabotage, uh, you know, she defined as like anything that that interferes with um, with the work getting done and the profits being made, hence the conscious withdrawal of the workers efficiency. Right. So just slowing down, not showing up. And, you know, they, the, the Wobblies even had a symbol of sabotage, a black cat. They called it the sab cat, the sabotage cat. Right. But by the time the espionage had been passed, she had kind of moved away from that, right? She wasn't actually ag- actively advocating for sabotage. And um, and when she was rounded up, uh, along with Carlo Tresca who, and the, anarch- the Italian anarchist who was um, her lover and, and close political associate at the time, um, and uh, her response to that was, look, <clears throat> let's work to get 
the, all these wobblies are rounded up and 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 indicted under the Espionage Act, including Flynn and and she and Tresca and I think it was Giovaniti, Arturo Giovaniti, also one of the the wobblies, um, Italian. Uh, decided that what they would do is they would work to have their cases severed, meaning that they would be tried separately. And the thinking was if we rather than let them try us as wobblies, right, along with every other wobbly in our region who is rounded up, we will advocate for separate trials and that will clog the system. That will cost a ton of money and that will frustrate our um, <clears throat> accusers. And it's a it's a really worthwhile strategy. It's what they did in during the free speech fights in various locales. They just made it way too costly in terms of time and money to to prosecute. So that was what she had argued. Uh, Bill Haywood, on the other hand, said no. Um, you can do that because you are famous and you have a lot of friends. And they they did spring to her defense. They founded the Elizabeth Hurley Flynn Defense Committee, and people will raise money for you. But that's not a strategy that's going to work. And we need to also embody the principle of solidarity and stand trial together. <clears throat> and so that was part of their falling out. Um, another part of the falling out was a disagreement over how to raise and, and disperse uh, defense funds. I mean, it, you know, Haywood wanted a more centralized structure. Flynn wanted, you know, was a, a was very trustworthy with money. She handled money for defense campaigns all throughout her career, but had a different idea about how that should be, um, how that should be done. Um, but it was this public uh, disagreement with Haywood over whether they should be tried, the Wobblies should be tried separately or not. That was um, uh, really significant. And in the end, uh, she did get her trial severed and she actually did not go to prison. Uh, she never even came to trial. She wrote to, um, um, and she wrote to the Wilson administration on the advice of uh, Joseph Tumulty, uh, who was one of uh, Wilson's aides, and uh, basically asked to um, for leniency. And it's it's a kind of a difficult letter to read uh, because she basically says, "Look, I'm a mom, and I have to provide for my family. I'm also a daughter, and I have to provide for my own mother, and that's why I do all the speaking on the circuit." And that's incompatible with the notion of a revolutionary radical, again, using gender, maternity, uh, domesticity as an argument for like, you know, don't, don't, don't hold it against me for doing these things. And she is not tried. She escapes trial. And Haywood is, of course, furious and, and uh, argues, as do people who agreed with him, even including historians like Melvin Dubofsky, that she was kind of a sellout for that. It was you know, a humiliating performance and she sold out. Um, she agreed that she would not speak publicly against the war as part of the conditions of you know, not, uh, not coming to trial. Um, and what she did instead was she founded an organization in 1918 called the Workers' Defense Union, which advocated for every person who was, who was a labor activist and had been uh, arrested, um, convicted, tried, and pr imprisoned, any, any of those, right, um, under the Espionage Act. So she dedicated the next five years of her life to advocating for people who did come to trial or who did get arrested uh, and, and imprisoned uh, under the Espionage Act. Haywood, uh, who talked a big game about solidarity and let's stand together, jumped bail and fled to the Soviet Union. So my response to that is like, okay, in the end, who really did demonstrate solidarity with the working classes? It was Flynn who stayed and fought the good fight. Um, so uh, yeah, that's that was her um, that was her World War I experience. She never did serve uh, a prison sentence, but she absolutely organized and <laughs> organized. Uh, if you know about the Espionage Act, you could you could be imprisoned for speaking against the war, interfering in any way with recruitment of the troops or speaking against the allies. So, you know, there was someone who made a, rep, uh, a film about the, the American Revolution and was arrested under the Espionage Act because it reflected poorly on England. Um, hello, <laughs> it was the, the 18th century revolution. But so um, while she was head of the Workers' Defense Union, she advocated for uh, Indian activists seeking, um, uh, uh, you know, seeking uh, the liberation of India from colonial rule uh, by uh, Great Britain. Um, she advocated for Mexican anarchists like the Magone brothers who were seeking, uh, you know, uh, a, a free Mexico, right? To, to free uh, Mexico from, um, colonial rule. So she was, she advocated for black uh, radicals who were imprisoned on the Espionage Act, women and, and uh, radicals who were not known 
outside of their immediate circles were the ones who most uh, got her attention because she said, you know, people who have a labor union behind them to support them or big names like Eugene Debs. I mean, she was absolutely pro Debs, but, but said like, you know, it's the people who have no one with power to support them that we really need to advocate for because they'll just languish in prison. And she did. Um, she advocated for the people who nobody had ever heard of before. And that's who Sacco and Benzetti were. Uh, she was the first American to learn about their case. They were nobodies. They were these two Italians languishing in prison in Massachusetts framed um, for a crime they almost certainly did not commit, or at least one of them, uh, Benzetti, almost certainly did not commit. And she made them into household names. Um, and it was because she, she understood that without uh, a strong movement behind them, not just of the Italian and, and anarchists around the world who are advocating for them, but liberals and English speaking Americans who could advocate for them, they would um, almost certainly languish uh, in there and, and, and be convicted. In fact, they were convicted, but they certainly didn't languish unknown in prison. They became, you know, world known. Um, and she's the one who started the fire that burned uh, around the globe for their release. She's the reason we know who they are. Not because of, you know, the liberals or the Supreme Court justices who wrote articles in 20, 1926 or took the case in 1926. In 1921, she was traveling, you know, talking to groups of 10 people saying, come on, you got to support these guys. You got to, this is a frame up. And, and she never gave up ever um, and was committed to them, the boys, as she called them. And never forgot them for the rest of her life. You know, she would remember them on the anniversary of their execution. And I think it really hurt her deeply when uh, the, the campaign failed to save them. She takes a break in Portland uh, for a number of years due to personal and health reasons. But she ultimately returns east and emerges as a communist. Um, and she's also fiercely anti-fascist at the time of the Spanish Civil War and the rise of fascism. Can we talk a little bit about this period of her life? You know, the, the, the book that I'm writing is, uh, I use uh, civil liberties as the through line, right? It's a book about Elizabeth Rilly Flynn's civil liberties activism. And part of her civil liberties activism was anti-fascism because fascism is a criminal ideology. It is an anti-democratic ideology. You cannot have freedom and fascism, uh, no matter how people try to frame it, right? And um Gurley Flynn, because of her relationship with uh, Carlo Tresca and uh, anarchists generally, right? So she was part of that Italian anarchist circle. She was never like an insider. She didn't speak Italian. She was, you know, she was a, a, an Irish American woman, but she was uh, close to a number of uh, Italian anarchists. That's how she became, you know, that's why she went to see Sacco and Benzetti. They trusted her. Um, and uh, anarchists, Italian anarchists, were the original Antifa in the U.S. Uh, they were the first ones to recognize the danger that Mussolini posed, um, while other Americans, um, including some very apparently open-minded liberals, were saying, well, you know, he's kind of a dashing figure, and those Italians, they need a little discipline, and she was saying, uh-uh, uh, this, is, this is a dangerous person. He is destroying labor movements. He is destroying democracy. She made an analogy between the Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan in the U.S. and their racial terror that they practice, and uh, the black shirts in Italy. And so she was often the only English speaker on the podium at anti-fascist meetings in the 1920s in the United States. Um, and in fact, while she was out in Portland, Carlo Tresca, because her family was worried about her out there, and Carlo Tresca, who is part of the reason she was out there, because he had an affair and a daughter with her sister, one of her youngest younger sister, Sabina, um, <clears throat> Tresca tried to lure her back with a job working for the Anti-Fascist Alliance of North America. And uh, that didn't work. She spent more time out. So by the time out, out West, so by the time she came back in the thirties, uh, she joined the communist party. It wasn't so much that the anti, that she became an anti-fascist when she joined the communist party. It was that part of what drew her to the communist party was it's anti-fascism. Um, Cause anti-fascism originally in the U S was very much, it was a radical thing, you know, radical, uh, uh, Ad activists were the original anti-fascists, but anarchists in particular, Italian anarchists. And so um, when she becomes a communist, it is their anti-fascism that is part of what attracts her. What else attracts her is it's the period of the popular front. And Gurley Flynn was nothing if not a bridge builder, particularly in her early career, like the campaign to save Sacco and Vanzetti. I mean, she had like liberals, socialists, communists, anarchists, vegetarians. I mean, you know, the, the mainstream labor movement, 
feminists. Uh, she had everybody involved in the campaign. And because she stressed, like, we got to get them out. They are unjustly imprisoned. She had no truck with like ideological divisions at, at that point. And so the popular front was very appealing to her because here was, and she had read um, Dimitrov's speech where he outlines, you know, anti-fascism is our, is our, you know, primary cause and we will work with, uh, to protect democracy, right? We will, we will build alliances. And, and that really spoke to her. Um, so, uh, yeah, she saw, she is, a. a an advocate for um, the Republican cause in Spain. She develops a friendship with La Pasionaria, with Dolores Ibaruri. They actually meet uh, after World War II. Um, she works to raise money for the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, the volunteer uh, force that went from the US to, um, to fight fascism. She had nothing but praise for the Connolly uh, Brigade, which was the Irish uh, right volunteers who went to fight in, in Spain. Um, but all of that was already there, right? The seeds of all that were there. Um, even before she became a communist. I, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, and this I think really helps me to understand uh, the choices that she made. If there was, she was an advocate for working people, for the working classes. She was an enemy of capitalism. And in the early years of her career, it was the IWW. That was the train that was pulling out of the station that was you know, chugging the fastest on the tracks and she was on it. Um, in the 30s, it was the Communist Party. I mean, this was, you know, all the cool kids were communists in the 30s. And I'm not saying that in a trivial way, right? If you were somebody who really had something to offer, if you were creative, if you were, if you were innovative, if you were committed to the struggle in the 30s, you were a communist or at least a, an ally, right? A fellow traveler. And so it was natural that she would do this. This put her back on the front lines of the struggle, um, and she joined and, and, and she was valuable to them. Here was a link that they could, they could point to and say, look, we are part of American labor politics and labor history. And here's evidence of that. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, the Lawrence strike, the Patterson strike, the free speech funds, the Passaic strike of 1926, Sacco and Vanzetti, um, you know, Debs, like she linked the party to all of these very, very pivotal moments and pivotal events um, and pivotal characters in U.S. labor history. Um, and it was a terrific match. During World War II, there's an increasing anti-communist feeling uh, with Smith Act and the ACLU ultimately expelled her. She was later imprisoned herself and she wrote extensively about prison reform which is incredibly forward thinking considering the time. Um, you know, she was writing about prison reform long before the likes of Angela Davis, for example. So, um, you know, the, the 1939, August 23rd, 1939, the announcement of the Nazi Soviet pact, right? Uh, is, is the, so that really puts uh, communists in the United States in a difficult position. Right. And, and they were clearly caught off guard by this. Um, so all of a sudden, uh, the, this, this organization and these individuals that are fiercely committed to anti-fascism, that give, many of them give their lives, right? The, the volunteers and the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, the ones who didn't come back, you know, they made the ultimate sacrifice. Um, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> the Nazi Soviet pact is announced and they have to figure out what to do um, because uh, under the terms of the Nazi Soviet pact, right, the, the 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 party is um, decides to tone down its revolutionary rhetoric, to uh, shift away from its uh, efforts um, <clears throat> to from its uh, anti-fascist, explicit anti-fascist uh, activism and rhetoric, and they uh, reframe the conflict in Europe as an imperialist war. Um, and so the, you know, the, the Great Britain, France, the United States, these are all imperialist powers gunning for this imperialist uh, uh, war and uh, the Yanks are not coming, right? We're not, we're not gonna, we're not gonna get involved in this. Um, and it's, you could understand how it would be complicated and difficult because um, on the one hand you have, you know, uh, this recognition that the, the, that the Soviet Union has got to do what it's got to do to protect itself. The, the Munich Pact, I mean, people point to the Nazi Soviet Pact, but they don't actually also point to the Munich Pact and say, look, the allies were willing to do the same thing, right? We'll look the other way um, to, to 
preserve the peace, uh, at least our peace, a little bit longer. Um, and then the, the Nazi-Soviet pact is the, the big deal in the U.S. How could they do that? How could they do that? Well, I mean, the Soviet Union is doing the same thing, right? Rightly or wrongly, they are attempting to survive because um, the, there is no love between uh, the Nazis and the, and the Soviet Union. Um, but it's complicated for, for people like Elizabeth Gurley Flynn because she's been an anti-fascist since the 1920s. So now all of a sudden it's an imperialist war and, and she doesn't actually. One of the things that, that, I, um, that I think is very clear if you look at her work in the, in, you know, from 1939 until uh, uh, you know, the invasion of the Soviet Union, she does not tone down the anti-fascist uh, rhetoric. When, when uh, the US is um, the, threatening to pass uh, a law that would uh, establish, make it uh, easy to deport um, radicals and imprison those in concentration camps who weren't deportable, but but otherwise deport radicals. She pushes back against that because it would deport anti-fascists to certain deaths um, in Europe. So, you know, she, she calls out the dangers uh, to anti-fascist activists of uh, legislation, this kind of both sides legislation that's being debated in Congress. Um, and the Smith Act is a both both sides uh, uh, law, right? It is, uh, we have to protect ourselves. It's called, it's, it's a communazi law, right? There's, there's uh, the sense that the communists and the Nazis are equally bad and we need to protect ourselves from subversion and es espionage uh, by either the right or the left. Um, in truth, uh, the Smith Act destroyed uh, the Communist Party. It, did, it, was, it was not the right, the, the Nazis were hardly ever, um, uh, scrutinized as heavily as uh, the left was uh, under the Smith Act. Um, but uh, yeah, so she's, this is problematic, right? So the ACLU in uh, 1940 passes its own Kaminazi resolution, which basically says that, you know, we have no truck with either the Soviet Union or the Nazis and anybody who is involved, who is a Nazi or a communist uh, is not uh, welcome on the board of the ACLU because you can't be a, a defender of, of civil liberties if you are affiliated with a totalitarian state. And uh, Flynn was the only open communist at that time on the board, left on the board. She had been reelected recently, so they knew she was a member of the party. Um, she would not recant. She would not quit the party, uh, nor would she silently walk away from the board. She said, you'll have to kick me off. Um, and they did. Uh, they, they, um, they tried her. And uh, they uh, decided that she had no place on the board and uh, could not be a, a supporter of civil liberties if she was a communist. And she defended herself eloquently. Um, it's, a, it's, uh, a really, it's a shame actually what they did to her because nothing about her had changed. And she showed that she was as staunch a defender of free speech as she had ever been. And in fact, the ACLU was founded in 1920. She had been fighting for free speech since 1908. Um, in Missoula, Montana with the IWW and the free speech fight. So she had been a free speech fighter way before um, just about anyone who was trying her and finding her wanting as a free speech fighter in 1940 had been. Um, it was a, a low moment for the ACLU. They have since um, recognized the error of their ways. Uh, they lost a lot of members. Uh, they took a lot of grief for that. Um, and Flynn, um, it was a personal insult. In fact, after they deliberated, she was at a bar next door um, and they just neglected to tell her what the decision was. Um, that's how little consideration they had for her feelings. And tragically, it, the, the decision, which was in early May, to jettison her from the board happened uh, not long after her only son, Fred, had died. Um, of cancer. And so she was uh, really she was nursing a lot of personal wounds. Um, and uh, this, the, I think the personal wound and the, the kind of public humiliation that they attempted to um, inflict on her was really awful. Um, there is no evidence ever that Elizabeth Gurley Flynn uh, worked to suppress the civil liberties of anyone, um, whether in the interest of the Soviet Union or any other interest. Um, and the ACLU, I think now recognizes that, uh, but they did not at the time. And then the Smith Act, well, uh, that's kind of a, 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 a sad story as well, because the Smith Act is, uh, it, it, the Smith Act is uh, passed. Uh, the only congressperson who spoke against it was Vito Marcantonio, a member of the American Labor Party, who was an ally of the CP. There's no, he never formally declared his identity as a communist, but he was very much in line with, um, you know, what 
the party was doing. And he's the only person who actively spoke against it. Um, and the law essentially made it a uh, called for the, the uh, registration of uh, foreigners in the U.S., right? So it created a database of, of uh, foreign residents of the U.S. And it also made it a crime to um, teach, to advocate, teach, or conspire to advocate or teach the overthrow of the government by force and violence. Um, and it was, again, targeted towards uh, Nazis and communists, but it was way more effective at destroying uh, the Communist Party than it was at, at, at anything else. Um, but the kind of dark spot on this is the first actual leftist organization that was tried under the Smith Act um, was uh, an organization of Trotskyists, the Socialist Workers Party. And when the Trotskyists were uh, tried, indicted and tried under the Smith Act, I think it was 1941, uh, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn did not speak out in their defense. And in fact, uh, the party's official position on that was that the Trotskyists deserved what they got because um, they were pro-fascist. They were these you know, terrible, horrible people. Um, and they were essentially their rivals, right? Their, uh, their enemies. And so they um, cheered the prosecution of the Trotskyist under the Smith Act. And uh, that came back to haunt them um, when... Um, in 1948, 12 of the leaders, um, pretty much everybody who was important except Flynn, uh, were rounded up and indicted under the Smith Act um, and uh, convicted. Uh, they were found guilty and imprisoned. And um, and the Trotskyists actually spoke in defense of their communist uh, uh, enemies uh, who were indicted under the Smith Act, even though the party had not done anything for the defense of the Trotskyists um, you know, at the, at the early part of the 40s. Uh, so that's kind of a I don't know, kind of an unpleasant fact. Gurley Flynn never, I mean, she spoke, the party opposed the Smith Act when it was being debated, uh, but they did not oppose its use against the Trotskyists and nor did Flynn. Um, and, uh, and then uh, she organized the defense campaign in uh, response to the indictments of the 12 in 1948. Um, but it was kind of a different world then. Um, the war was over. Uh, the you know, during the war, there was great uh, alliance between the Soviet Union and the United States and the Battle of Stalingrad, for example, was this really dramatic moment. The defense of Moscow uh, before that had showed that um, the, the Nazis were not invincible, that they could be defeated. That was an incredible booster of morale. Um, and, that, and, and the Red Army's defense of Stalingrad, the civilian defense of Stalingrad, I mean, this whole dramatic moment, um, you know, you had people in the U.S. just just you know, white knuckled and cheering, you had Flynn and other communists really concerned about the survival of the Soviet Union. Um, she really put her heart and soul into the war effort and the campaign against uh, fascists to, to, you know, actively worked to um, ensure that Irish Americans uh, supported uh, the war. Um, uh, but after the war, that kind of fell apart um, with the, uh, the death of Roosevelt and the uh, uh, you know, Truman's uh, ascension to the presidency and, you know, launching of the Cold War, basically, um, uh, with the, um, the Truman Doctrine, right, the aid to Greece and Turkey uh, speech. Um, and so even though Truman pledged that he would not uh, participate in the suppression of the labor movement at home, even as he pursued an anti-communist agenda abroad, his kind of signing on to that vehement anti-communist agenda um, abroad really legitimated uh, repression at home. Um, and that, you know, I, although Truman wasn't directly involved in the work that was being done uh, to pull together the indictments against the 12 communists in 48, um, it was, he had established a climate that really made that possible. Um, and then in 51, Flynn herself is, is indicted under the Smith Act and found guilty um, in 1953. So, um, it was, it was uh, while she was running the defense campaign in 48 and 49 for the, for the, the 12 leaders, um, including the general secretary, William Z. Foster, who then his, his case was severed because he had health issues. But, you know, um, Robert Thompson, who was a hero um, of World War II, who had fought in Spain and, and others who were at the head of the party, um, she could not do what she did for Sacco and Vanzetti. Um, she could not build this alliance of liberals and mainstream labor organizations. And because there was the, 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 the Red Scare um, was just too powerful, uh, even the ACLU, um, you know, while it while it deplored uh, the use of the Smith Act, um, really did not go out of its way to defend 
the communists. Um, and, and part of what bit them in the butt was that they, you know, they were fine with the prosecution of the Trotskyists um, earlier, uh, right before the war. And now all of a sudden we're claiming that the Smith Act was a violation of civil liberties. And that's partly true. But, you know, I, I suspect even if they had fought for the Trotskyists in the, in, you know, earlier, there was just no stopping this juggernaut in 48, 49, 50, 51. I mean, the Red Scare was in full bloom and the Soviet Union didn't help, right? With the invasion of Czechoslovakia, um, uh, it really kind of um, seemed to vindicate Truman's view that this was gonna be a struggle um, to push back Soviet efforts to dominate the globe. And so, you know, what started, and think about the difference, right? Where we started this conversation, you've got like 1908, 1909, Missoula and Spokane passing these local ordinances to repress free speech. By 1948, 49, you've got uh, the repression of, of communists, their civil liberties in against the backdrop of the Cold War and the race uh, for dominance between the US and the Soviet Union. So the stakes are much, much different here. Um, and it's, it's an uphill struggle and, um, she just can't, she can't pull off what she was able to do earlier. Um, uh, she was much more isolated, uh, and the party was much more isolated. Um, the popular front years were over and, uh, yeah, it just, uh, things really, uh, really take a downturn for radical politics in the U S at that time. Uh, and from which we've, we've not yet recovered. So she's a movement person. Like the U.S. is a hyper individualistic culture, right? Like, oh, the individual, the individual, the individual, we kind of poo poo collective action. But we all know that like that's a, you know, that's an ideology that serves powerful interests very well. And that collective action is really the only way working people have um, to 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 gain any power and to, to force any changes that make their lives better in, in substantial material ways. And Flynn is a movement person. And if you're a movement person, the movement comes first, right? Your own personal needs. Uh, and and she, I mean, her son, you know, laments that his mom didn't spend a lot of time with him. She, you know, uh, had a, uh, you know, a really exciting, rich life at times, but but probably spent a lot of time alone. Um, but it was, the sacrifices were all for the movement. And maybe this was just part of, you know, what you sacrifice for a movement. You're in a movement, you're in a movement. Um, it's not about your personal misgivings. It's about what's best for the movement. She's elected the first female chair of the Communist Party um, and she dies in the Soviet Union and she's given a state funeral, which is extraordinary in itself. What a funeral. If you watch the AP footage, if you Google it, you can watch her funeral footage. Wow. I mean, like, this is a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. So she's she's tried and, and convicted under the Smith Act. She goes to prison in memoir, which is, I think, a really interesting book. She also wrote while she was you know, between 53 and 55 during the appeals process, she wrote her first autobiography. Um, so she did write these two books and, and they're really interesting to read. Um, um, and she goes to the Soviet Union uh, in 1960 for the first time. She goes to Copenhagen for the anniversary of International Women's Day and then goes on to the Soviet Union. She never did go to Ireland. Um, she went to, to, went to England, uh, visited Karl Marx's grave. This was a few years, you know, back in the uh, maybe late forties, uh, after the war, she goes to Paris. She loves Paris, um, really a lot. Um, uh, but she never makes it to Ireland. Although when her passport is revoked, she says, Oh, I'd like to go to Ireland, you know, and her passport is revoked. The McCarran Act, which was passed in 1950, um, basically so that if you're a member of the party, you know, you have to, um, you have to register. And since it's a criminal organization, you know, with foreign, a foreign based organization, you uh, cannot have a passport. So her passport after she goes to the Soviet Union, um, that, that first time um, her passport is, is uh, revoked. Um, and she has to, she and Herbert Aptheker actually have to fight um, to have them reinstated. Paul Robeson's passport was also uh, revoked. Um, because of the McCarran Act. And so she's able to travel then again after her passport is um, reinstated. Um, but but uh, before she goes back to the Soviet Union, in between those two trips to the Soviet Union, she is elected the first female chair of the Communist Party. Um, and uh, it's interesting when you read uh, biographies of other communists, like um, there's one woman, Dorothy Healy, who was uh, a member of the California Communist Party. And she talks about how Gurley Flynn rose up through the ranks uh, very quickly in the party. She And because she did, she didn't have a lot to prove. She was actually really nice to everybody because she had nothing to prove. Um, 
And she had done it all, seen it all, knew everybody. And so could be very magnanimous. I kind of think she would have been like that anyway, but you know, maybe I'm the one romanticizing her now. Um, but she, she did, she rose through the ranks of the party in part because she was so important to connecting the CP to the, you know, to us labor and radical traditions and to the U S generally, right? Like we are part of the American political landscape and, and, um, but in 61, she's elected the first female chair, which is the highest office. Um, but it's a largely symbolic post, right? The general secretary is the person with the power. Um, but it, it's striking because she is the first woman. Um, she also did not break away in 56 um, when most everybody else. So she's still around. She had never spoken publicly against the Soviet Union. Um, so it is an achievement, but it's, you know, it's also kind of got all these layers around it. Right. Um, but then three years later, she goes back to the Soviet Union. Um, and she dies there. She's she's got you know stomach issues, inflammation. She's got all kinds of health problems, um, and she is uh, yeah she is given a state funeral. It's quite impressive. It's quite a big deal. It kind of blows my mind. I'm gonna be really honest with you. I'm watching this film and I'm thinking, here's this woman from New Hampshire and the Bronx and then New York. Okay, like you know Manhattan, and, and she's given this extraordinary funeral in the Soviet Union. And then I'm thinking, and here's this woman from Ireland who wants to talk about her. Um, like, wow, like here in the U.S., quite frankly, if it doesn't happen within U.S. borders and we can't make a war out of it, uh, we, we, we don't care. Right. But but like, wow, like she is this global figure um, by the end of her life. And that's that's really incredible to me. Um, but yeah, it's this extraordinary funeral. Um, and then she's, her ashes are brought back here and she's buried in Chicago with the Haymarket Martyrs and Emma Goldman, and rightly so. You know, um, when she was convicted and sentenced under the Smith Act, the judge really was impressed uh, with her intellect. She defended herself and said, you could go and live in the Soviet Union and escape prison. She said, no, I'm an American. I'm staying here. Um, and yet, you know, she's, she's like, revered around the world. I think that's really cool. It's really terrific. Um, yeah, so she, um, she was imprisoned in the Alderson Federal Penitentiary for Women. And it was this, you know, it was in this very beautiful spot. Um, but as she noted uh, in her prison memoir, which was originally called the Alderson Story, but has been reissued by international publishers as my life as a political prisoner. Um, and I actually wrote the introduction, the foreword to the reissued version. Um, so I read the, the, the book very carefully several times and thought a lot about it. And uh, it's a really interesting um, prison memoir. It doesn't get nearly the attention that her autobiography does. Um, and in some ways it's dated because she introduces a lot of names and ideas that were very present in the moment, but, but maybe not so present in people's consciousness now. Um, but in other ways, I think it's really timeless. Um, so she notes at the beginning that like, no matter how bucolic this setting is, we're in prison. Once the doors close, it's it. We, we have no freedom. So this kind of recognition that like a prison is a prison, no matter what it looks like. She saw uh, right away that, uh, you know, most of the people who were imprisoned with her were poor people um, were and, and many of them were black or immigrants. Um, so she understood right away that that prison was a fate that uh, uh, people of means uh, usually did not have to endure. Um, so she recognized that she called out the militarization creep in the prison. And now again, this is a book that's published um, in, uh, you know, she's in prison in 1955, right? So the book is published, I think in 63 or 64, I can't remember the exact year right now, but um, she's making these, these claims about prison that are really sound very contemporary, right? That the law is not neutral, that prison is not a fate that awaits, um, you know, people with power or privilege as we might call it today. Um, that there is a, a kind of a synergy between uh, the discipline of the military and prison. Um, and that it is about, you know, the it is about state power um, and control. Um, and she's, she's very conscious throughout the prison memoir and throughout her stay in prison that she is a political prisoner. And as a, uh, you know, even when, back as far as uh, 1918, when she founded the Workers' Defense Union to advocate for people indicted under the Espionage Act, um, she, she fought for the U.S. to recognize political prisoner status uh, for people who were arrested, not because they had committed 
like ordinary crimes, but because they were political opponents of this, you know, the power of, of the capitalist state. And, and that never happened. We don't recognize political prisoners in the US, but she, she refused to admit that she was a criminal. She was a political and, and that sustained her throughout. And that, that comes through in the memoir, how her, um, her uh, understanding of herself as imprisoned for her politics um, really nourished her. And she recognized the other politicals there, the Puerto Rican uh, nationalists, the women uh, who were advocating for uh, the freedom of, of Puerto Rico uh, became friends of hers. Um, but she also recognized um, people who were in there for things that looked like crimes, but, but really weren't. So uh, addicts, right? So people who had a problem with substance abuse. She recognized, uh, and again, this is like very forward thinking for the time, that this is not a moral failure. These are not, you know, terrible, horrible people. These are not criminals. These are people who are ill and need treatment. These are people who the, the conditions of their lives have and poverty have driven them to things that uh, they uh, almost certainly would not ordinarily do. And they need compassion and understanding and, and treatment, not, not punishment. Uh, the memoir was not, um, was not widely uh, reviewed or received, um, although it, it, it was, uh, reviewed obviously by um, party publications and some progressive publications, um, but it was seen as very important by progressive social workers who actually picked it up and encouraged um, <clears throat> readership of it because it really laid out problems with um, the prison industrial complex that had not really been articulated before. Um, she was very close friends with Claudia Jones, uh, a younger woman, a black communist who was uh, very active in the, the Young Communist League and was uh, a writer um, <clears throat> and had written for the Daily Worker and, and uh, was actually arrested and targeted for deportation. Um, and uh, in uh, 19, I think 19, well, after the war, not long after the war, um, but then was rounded up with, with Flynn and imprisoned and Claudia Jones was, was um, Caribbean American. And uh, both her experiences as a communist and her friendship with Claudia Jones really sensitized her to uh, racial discrimination, not even her experiences as a communist, actually Flynn was an advocate for, um, uh, an anti-racist advocate from the very beginning of, of her career, but it was her work as a communist that really helped her to kind of develop more sophisticated ideas about the way that oppression works, that um, one can be oppressed as a woman or as a black woman or as a working class black woman. I mean, these are related but distinct uh, kinds of oppression. And so she recognized in the, in the, in the prison um, how um, segregation uh, was uh, implemented and how uh, racial discrimination against black prisoners, Claudia Jones, but not just Claudia Jones worked um, and wrote about that very poignantly in the memoir. Um, and she demonstrated that kind of kindness and compassion that, that we talked about with regards to Joe Hill and everyone else, because she was a, a party member, she had resources, right? She would get money. Her sister, Kathy, was a regular uh, letter writer. And she recognized that others didn't have people to write letters to them or to provide uh, any kind of funds for them to purchase things like cigarettes or whatever. So um, she would have uh, Christmas cards that she got uh, in you know, she'd have people write in pencil or, or not write anything in them at all. And she'd give them to the other prisoners to kind of decorate their cells with to make things a little brighter. She would share um, her resources that she got um, because she, again, she had the, the support of the party behind her um, to try to make people's lives a little bit easier. She would advocate um, for prisoners who were suffering um, racial discrimination. Uh, she celebrated the, the, the audacity and the bravery and the, the rightness of the cause of the Puerto Rican nationals and others. Um, when Claudia Jones was um, nearing uh, her time to be uh, released, um, she had serious health problems so she'd not, she, and she didn't serve as long a sentence as Flynn. And when she was released, she was deported, uh, but she was not deported back to her home country. She was deported to England actually. And she founded the um, Caribbean festival um, in, in, in London. Um, but she wrote poetry while she was in prison and she wasn't allowed to leave with the, with the poems and Elizabeth Gurley Flynn helped her memorize them so that she could then publish them when she left. They were very, very, very dear friends. Um, and I think they learned a lot from each other and Flynn's writings on women and race and class um, are very sophisticated. Time for her, I'm sure she was an older woman. She was overweight. It couldn't have been easy to be in prison. Um, but it was, you know, the memoir reveals someone who kept her humanity 
and really, you know, kept her dignity um, because she identified herself as a political prisoner. Uh, no matter what they tried to do to her, she, you know, she got knocked down, but she got up again. She's making arguments about the triple op oppression of black women in an article in Political Affairs in 1948. And of course, the irony is that inside the upper echelons of the party, people are like, yeah, she's like a mass figure. OK, like she wasn't theoretical and she wasn't into like organizational structure and arguing the merits of this or that kind of bureaucratic thing or. And and to me, like, I mean, ponder the irony of a, a party that claims to be advocating for the working class kind of poo pooing someone because her major talent is she connects and understands the working class. Well, hello. Um, you know, they needed her. And and they should have had, I think, more people like her. I mean, she really never lost that connection. And, and again, she was constantly learning. Right. So she really was ahead of her time. I mean, if you read the article in Political Affairs in 1948, it's really striking. And Angela Davis actually does say that she black people trusted her, her understanding or her efforts to understand the plight of um, black women in the United States were real. Um, and she was one of the few uh, white women who really could. Um, could, could be said to have really tried to understand and tried to articulate um, for white people uh, these had the way these issues really had to be had to be um, brought together in if we were to understand um, you know the, the, the struggles of black women. Um, she's just she's amazing. Um, she really is very forward thinking and I think she really deserves to be better known. She was clearly very far ahead of her time. I think sometimes it takes society time to catch up on people. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn is one. Conley, I think, is another. Um, but there have been some criticisms of her. Unjustly, I feel, that she wasn't theoretical enough when she was incredibly active in driving change. Um, she was engaged in working class communities and she listened to people. You know, the ironic thing when she's in prison, this and the, the, the mandate comes to desegregate. And uh, so the prison warden asks Flynn and Claudia Jones if they would lead the camp because of their experiences in the Communist Party and the party's known commitment to um, you know, anti-racism. So ironically, you have this woman who is in prison because she is a communist who is asked by the prison uh, warden to help desegregate the prison to help. So to help, can you help us comply with federal law? You terrible, horrible communist um, by uh, helping us to desegregate the prison and she and Jones do it. You know, they, 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 they take, they say, sure, we'll, 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 we'll do what we can because they had experience and, you know, their friendship was a model. Um, and she talks about how some of the, the black uh, female women prisoners um, came to accept her because of her relationship with Claudia Jones. Um, but I thought that was a really great irony that she is asked to help desegregate the prison because they don't know what to do, but the communists will know. To finish up, what is her relevance today? I think her commitment to civil liberties uh, is something that we should also um, you know, look to her uh, for a model. I, I'm very concerned about some of the things that people who call themselves leftists in the US are okay with these days, like you know, pushing people off of um, social media platforms. Now granted, these are private corporate platforms, but they're, they are, you know, we know that they're the, the way that you reach a mass audience. And I don't think that anyone who calls themselves a leftist um, or a socialist or whatever label you wanna use uh, should be okay with, um, with any form of censorship. Um, because it always comes back. It's like the whole example of the Trotskyists, right? Yeah, you can you can censor my enemy. Hello, guess what? It's only a matter of time before uh, they come for <clears throat> come for you. And so I think she models a commitment to civil liberties that that uh, we all should um, we all should aspire to. Um, I think she models a uh, you know a compassionate way of doing politics, caring for people, uh, putting working class people first. Uh, theory is great. You could read Marx and Gramsci all you want, but like, what do you do when you walk past a picket line? You know, can you do, you know how how do you show your support for Amazon workers or Starbucks workers or the the miners in Alabama who are been on strike for months now? Like, if if you're if you can't talk to them, if your your heart isn't with them. 
then you're not a radical socialist, right? You're a theorist, but you're not an activist. Um, so I think she models that. That um, I also think that tactically, uh, she models uh, the importance of of uh, having of a campaign that has a, a, an identifiable goal. So all of the campaigns that she got involved with, whether it was you know um, for uh, to defend the, the Smith Act prisoners, Sacco and Vanzetti. Um, you know, Joe Hill, or even generally the Workers' Defense Union, they always, they always were, the goals were clearly defined, right? Like we are going to advocate for anyone who's imprisoned under the Espionage Act. Labor activists should not be silenced. We are going to advocate for the release of Sacco and Vanzetti. We are, and we are always going to advocate for the, the, the activists who have the least developed network. Not, we're not riding the bandwagon. We are lifting up those activists who have no one else to lift them up. Um, and, I, you know, even the, the free speech fights, right? We demonstrate, we protest. These are really fun, rowdy protests. She's, you know, in the streets, even if she didn't chain herself to a lamppost at 19, she still, you know, stood up and, and fought back on street corners. But it was because there was a law that had been passed that made street speaking with a labor message illegal, right? So like protests, demonstrations are great, but they have to have a purpose. Campaigns are really great, mass campaigns, but they have to have a purpose and a goal um, and a clearly identified, you know, um, structure to, and and I think that that's, that's a lot of what Elizabeth Gurley Flynn models for us. I think she models the courage and the bravery that you need to have the ability to withstand criticism. Um, so yeah, I think, and, and if I will add, in the U.S., um, I'm working with a couple of people. Uh, one um, one woman who's looking at radical uh, Irish uh, Irish women in Butte, Montana, um, uh, Eileen Markey, and then uh, McDowell Vallely, who's doing a, a documentary on Mike Quill, who is a, a it's fabulous. You, my dad was in the Transport Workers Union and Mike Quill came after that, right? The, the, the Irish Civil War came to the U.S. and said, OK, I lost that battle, but I'm here to fight again. Right. And they were these fierce, uh, radical activists and very much, you know, in tune with the cause of black liberation and also the liberation of the working classes and Irish Americans. You know, that's not usually what people think of when they think of us. So I think she also models like another way of doing Irish American, um, that you don't have to be a cop or a fireman, though there's nothing wrong with, you know, doing that. You don't have to be work in finance, that you can, you can, there are other ways to do it. Um, and that being an Irish American is not always wielding a club in favor of power, that sometimes it is standing up and taking a hit um, uh, on behalf of yourself and others who feel the, the effects of power. And you have a book coming out on Elizabeth Gurley Fling. Can you tell us um, when it will be out? <laughs> yes. So I'm. It's a. It's a. It's delayed by COVID. It's the 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 title. Uh, the working title, which I hope will be the the title title, because I love it, is the Rebel Girl Democracy and Revolution. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn's work for civil liberties, and you know there are a couple of biographies of Flynn, but they're a little. It's hard to tell her life story because she does so many things. But what was clear to me, um, and I've been reading her words and words about her and listening to whatever footage is out there since I was in my 20s. You know, I fell in love with her um, as a 20 or 20 something. And, and now I'm a 50 something and the, the love affair continues. And um, one of the things that became clear to me early on was that the through line, the thing that really, really connects everything she did from a girl on a soapbox in Union Square to, you know, defending herself against the Smith Act indictments was she was a fierce advocate of civil liberties, the right to speak, the right to assemble, the right to a fair trial, and not as abstract concepts, but we cannot have a strong working class movement in the US or anywhere if we do not have the right to assemble and represent ourselves and advocate for our cause. And that's what made her a free speech fighter. Obviously that's what, you know, that's what inspired the Workers' Defense Union, her help in founding the ACLU, um, her advocacy for, for um, Sacco and Vanzetti, her work uh, as a communist, she advocated for civil liberties as, as a communist um, and, and up until the very end of her life. Um, and so that is, I'm on the last chapter, the archives that I need shut down for COVID. So I've got to request the materials electronically and uh, they're still not open the archives. And that takes a little bit of time because they've all then got to be digitized. But I, it is, it is, um, 
moving forward, I'm hoping I'll be done with it actually the manuscript by the summer and then send it off. And then it'll probably take a year after that. Uh, so I'm really excited about it. I'll let you know when it comes out. I hope you read it. It's intended to be, well, it was, I hope I intend it to be impeccably researched. Um, it is not intended to be a dry, dull scholarly book because I just think that's just, she just doesn't deserve that. Thank you so much for your time. It's been really enlightening listening to you. Um, I think we've all learned a huge amount about Elizabeth Crowley Flynn today. Um, and I think it's fitting that we're doing a podcast about her on International Women's Day. Um, and I look forward to reading your book when it comes out. And thank you all for listening. Uh, we'll be back again with our second podcast for International Women's Day. And we'll also be back next month with our normal monthly podcast. So until then, slong of oil.